Du, jag måste kunna använda det här liksom, så att det är det som är problemet. Kan man stänga den eller vad ska jag göra? Nej, jag måste bara ha den liksom här ja. så att, ja, okay, att den är inte så känslig. Dear colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Eva. Uh, again, I'm really, really pleased uh, once again to open the Sweden-Japan uh, top scientist lecture. This is uh, beginning to be a quite a long tradition, and it's always as as fun as the previous time, if not more. Over many years, we have really uh, together highlighted key areas of research, and uh, that has also been an important part of strengthening our our mutual networks and collaborations. I can say uh, with confidence that uh, Sweden and Japan are both uh, very strong uh, knowledge and innovation economies, and both are fully uh, recognizing that this is the very foundation of our global competitiveness and prosperity, and therefore also uh, the social welfare of our nations. Uh, international collaboration between knowledge-intensive countries such as Sweden and Japan is, of course, an asset for both parties. Sharing this knowledge and experience between uh, what I like to say trusted parties is today perhaps more important than, than it has ever been before. And Eva has a history of 100 years, as I'm sure you're aware of, and internationalization has always been been part of it. Uh, we have had many different kinds of activities where we promote international relations, uh, not the least the Swedish offices of, of science and inv innovations, where Japan has been an important uh, uh, prioritized country uh, as long as from 1967. And an another activity that EVA has been engaged in is, is uh, facilitating the foundation of engineering academies in, in other countries. And of course, this was also including the engineering academy in Japan in 1987. So these are really long traditions that, that we're talking about here. Of course, uh, if you think about the world today, I mean, independent organizations with high level of expertise uh, such as science academies and engineering academies, are really an important role these days as policy advisors. And it's a role that I think that is going to be strengthened uh, given the current uh, world situation, uh, complex in terms of science, complex in terms of technology, and also the geopolitical context. So uh, our uh, long standing uh, collab collaborative uh, uh, relationship is really a good example uh, of this kind of uh, long-standing relationship. And our shared agenda, which is actually extending from excellence-based uh, scientific academic collaboration to large-scale research infrastructure such as the synchrotrons and neutral spallation, and further on also to collaborations engaging industrial partners. So we have been able to jointly uh, address these social challenges quite at the board, board, broad base. And today uh, we will be concentrating on solar cells. I look really forward to another uh, important and inspiring Sweden-Japan top scientist lecture. And I give the word now to Thomas Koberger, who is going to introduce us the program. So welcome on the scene. Thank you for me. Thank you very much. I'm Thomas Kåberg. I'm a professor at Chalmers, and I'm also spending about a quarter of my time as the executive board chairman of Japan Renewable Energy Institute in Tokyo. This uh, event is um, illustrating collaboration already in the set of organizers that we 
just saw on the screen with uh, the Embassy of Japan, Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, the Swedish Japan Foundation, and the Swedish Foundation for Strategic Research as co-organizers. It is um, coming at the right moment in time because we are seeing a dramatic energy transition going on around us. In China last year, 200 gigawatt of new solar PV capacity was installed, some 75 gigawatt of wind, a lot of batteries, but not re uh, readily available in the statistics. In the US, the Energy Information Administration are foreseeing that in this year alone, there will be around uh, 36 gigawatt of solar 14 gigawatt of batteries and 8 gigawatt of wind and a little bit of gas and one nuclear reactor. This is an interesting transition for those of us who work with it and many of you here do. But it's also a transition where countries like Japan and for some years Europe were pioneering 30 years ago in this development but if we look at the current situation, we see an overwhelming dominance of Chinese industries. And this is well recognized in the European Commission, in the United States administration, as well as in the Japanese government. And we see attempts now to regain control of the industries, the technologies and the supply chains. These efforts go under different names, especially there are many names in Europe, you know, Repower EU, Fit for 55, Net Zero Industry Initiatives. In the US it's called the Inflation Reduction Act and is one of the largest financial projects in US history. And in Japan we saw the Kishida government about a week ago launching the climate transition bond system in an attempt to revitalize the industry also in Japan. But to succeed in regaining the control or some sort of self-sufficiency in these areas, I think we all need to collaborate at least between Japan, Europe, North America to regain this control. And this event can be seen as one little contribution to this improved collaboration between in this case, Japan and Sweden. There are many qualified, competent people in the room, and the most qualified is the top scientist who we are honoring, or we are honored to have with us at this event, and that is Professor Tsutomu Miyasaka, who is going to deliver the top scientist lecture to us today. Now, he has a long background in solar PV technology, in battery technology, in other photo uh, chemistry applications. So we are privileged to be able to listen to you today. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, extremely uh, big, big honor for me to been invited to this uh, symposium funded by Sweden Japan Foundation. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm actually a chemist, a major in uh, electrochemistry and uh, more different uh, uh, photoelectrochemistry. So I try to uh, start my talk introducing the, my background of photoelectrochemistry. So can I scan my slide? Okay. This is the title. <clears throat> so to introduce my university, Toei Yokohama University, very small university west, located west of Tokyo City here, Yokohama. But not actually in downtown Yokohama, it's a suburb of Yokohama City. And this is a view of campus. And there's a faculty, we only have a fac faculty of medical engineering and sports science, law science, and yeah, it's a small university. <clears throat> The Toin is more famous for having a high school. This is uh, one of the biggest high schools in Japan, Toin University. So you, many people here, I think, 
I previously visited in Japan, the beautiful Kyoto city, having this in the springtime, it's actually a castle, Himeji, and this is Mount Fuji. Okay, this is my group. Uh, we have been doing uh, international collaboration with Taiwan, China, Italy, Germany, then India, and I have retired the university at the age of 63, I'm now becoming 71, and I'm still working as a the uh, project prof professor in this university, uh, supervising a PhD student. So first, the photoelectrochemistry started around the late 1960s. <coughs> so this is our history. The renaissance of semiconductor electrochemistry started in 1960, and it uh, started by Professor Gary Shantrevich, and also a young researcher, then Michael Gretzel, and interestingly, that is based on the science of uh, uh, silver halide photographic science. And the first paper uh, on the dye sensitized semiconductor electrode in the electrochemistry, it was started by using a chlorophyll, it's a natural pigment in the photosynthesizer. And the extension of this work is a uh, Discover, uh, uh, invention of dye sensitized uh, uh, photovoltaic cell that the Michael Gretzel published paper in Nature, and the, also in Japan, the Fujishima and uh, Honda uh, showed the water splitting uh, 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 experiment by using TI water as a semiconductor electrode. And uh, then that time, the young uh, Professor Fujishima was doing a semiconductor electrode, but then he switched to do, to make a photocatalyst to split water under UV light. This is a famous work done by Fujishima and Hashimoto. And uh, <clears throat> so the, I, was, I had been working on dye solar cell, <clears throat> and I spent 20 years in a company, Fuji Photofilm Company, and I switched to the university in 2001 and continued to work with a sensitized uh, semiconductor. But we discovered uh, the happening is we found the perovskite, the crystal we can sensitize that this TiO2 yeah, electrode to uh, <coughs> produce the power and we first first paper in 2009 to show the then the efficiency very low 3.8%. But anyway, the perovskite solar cell now achieved a very high efficiency 26%. So this is a <coughs> first paper published by uh, Gersha Trebich uh, showing zinc oxide electrode sensitized by the organic dye. And interestingly that uh, extension of this study to show the mo model of photosensitivity was done by using chlorophyll as a synthesizer. So this is a kind of a, uh, engineering model of the photosensitive primary process by using the dye synthesized semiconductor electrode, but dye was chlorophyll and derivatives. I also published paper in 1979 to show the chlorophyll monolayer coated on the tin oxide electrode can produce a photocurrent to uh, uh, give uh, the highest quantum conversion efficiency uh, on the electrode. This shows the spectral sensitivity of a photocurrent generated by the chlorophyll on, on the, uh, tin oxide electrode. So this is the mechanism of dye sensor solar cell invented by uh, Professor Gretzel. So this is the mesoporous CI auto electrode. This is a, a, a iodide, a, a iodine a redox agent. So this is the mechanism of how the voltage and photocurrent by generated by photo exciting the dye monolayer absorbed on the surface. <clears throat> so in university, I have started work to make a lightweight, flexible, plastic-based dye sensor solar cell 
for a practical application. So, uh, interestingly, this is a chlorophyll sensitized uh, electrode, plastic electrode. <laughs> and next one, this one, is same, the dye sensitized electrode, but what was dye? Dye is Nescafe. <laughs> So students were really enjoying making a dyson solar cell. Yeah. But perovskite solar cells are basic science studies in 2009, another six. The perovskite is the name of a, a crystal lattice structure, ABO3 or ABX3, but the, the perovskite crystals capable of uh, uh, photocurrent regeneration is limited to halide perovskite, ABX3 exahalide. The, in history, the first perovskite crystals was discovered in the late uh, 19th centuries. At that time, oh, no, no, uh, 1839, uh, the material was calcium uh, titanate. But then later, there was a group. Uh, uh, did the synthesis of halide uh, perovskite, uh, starting with cesium lead and uh, bromide iodine. iodide. Uh, this is the first synthesis of, synthesis of the uh, man-made man -made perovskite halide crystals. Now, this material is able to generate very high solar conversion efficiency. So, the power conversion efficiency of perovskite reached now 26.1%. It's certified by uh, 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 it's a certified efficiency, and this efficiency is uh, identical to the top efficiency of silicon, the solar cell. And by uh, jointing perovskite and silicon the same cell, that is tandem cell, efficiency now reached almost 34%. Very high. Efficiency. I'm very uh, glad to find the iod uh, iodine is a mo most necessary element in perovskite solar cell because ABX3 is three times more than the lead, and Japan is the second uh, uh, large producer in the world of iodine. Thirty percent of iodine is produced in Japan, and top country is at Chile. Mm. And so did the U.S. And I tried to check how about the situation in China. Possibly, or definitely, no iodine source in China available. So why do, do, do we start the perovskite making make in Japan? So I'm now focusing on the practical process uh, so that the company can start making a perovskite solar cell. The research background had a perovskite in Japan. Uh, who mentioned the perovskite can work as a semiconductor? This is Professor Ishihara in uh, the Tokyo Institute of Technology. She's still active in researcher. He published, published paper this year showing perovskite uh, as a semiconductor. But that, that time, uh, the, sorry, the um, composition was the organic lead uh, iodide. The organic part is a long chain iodide. This actually doesn't make a good semiconductor. This is a so-called two-dimensional uh, perovskite. But anyway, he mentioned, first mentioned, the perovskite can act uh, as a semiconductor, a semiconductor. And David Mitch in US, uh, she did a, a comprehensive synthesis of halide perovskite by changing the organic part. So in Japan, the JS, uh, JSPS <coughs> funded a project of research uh, focusing on the light emitting function of halide perovskite. This lasted five years in Japan uh, uh, around the turn of 20th century, and they mentioned the the 2D perovskite is capable of very intense light emission, monochromatic emission, uh, enabled by the extant formation. So this technology was applied to the 
for example, for example high speed of nonlinear optics and a luminescent diode and scintillator. But no one mentioned, no one tried to uh, apply the perovskite for the photovoltaic generation. So the background of discovery started by a startup company established in 2000, 2004 in Tong University, this is PEC cell. This is PEC cell indicate photoelectrochemical cell. I named this name uh, by myself. And uh, I recruit a young researcher from university, Dr. Teshima. He was supervising an able student, uh, Akihiro Kojima there. So he wants to start the dissection solar cell. So I accepted him to do, start some experiment in Tong University. And finally, he entered the Tokyo University. There I was doing a guest professor five years. Fortunately, he decided to continue the work and finally got efficiency one to four uh, percent by having been uh, reporting the result in ECS, Electrochemical Society meeting in the US. And what happened is then that I sent my able student Murakami of Tony University to EPF in Switzerland to, uh, to uh, increase uh, dissect structural efficiency, but he made a good friend with uh, Henry Snakes that he was doing a solidification of dissect structural cell. And he, then he thought this, his materials is a spirometer may be able to be applied to uh, low efficiency perovskite solar cell to increase efficiency. So anyway, he then came back to Oxford University, he had University, then he uh, sent his student to Tong University to uh, do experiment to make perovskite solar cell. Then uh, they succeeded in solidifying the perovskite solar cell. We started with photoelectrochemical by using a liquid redox uh, electrolyte that can resolve the perovskite crystalline. The lifetime is very, very poor, just continue less than one minute. So by solidification, they can stabilize the perovskite solar cell and finally got efficiency exceeding 10%, publishing paper science. Then the world people became interested in uh, reproduce the uh, efficiency. That is the result of recent very high efficiency. Uh, this is our first uh, report in uh, in, in, in uh, 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 electrochemical society meeting, 2006, showing the first report of perovskite sensitized uh, electrochemical solar cell. Then, 2006, we also uh, reported in ECS meeting USA, this year is the start of perovskite study in Japan. Mm. Uh, we are tackling uh, changing the spectral sensitivity by using iodide, bromide, uh, or, the, or the mixture, or the increased efficiency, but efficiency is only 2% here, you can see. Uh, this is a paper uh, report in 2007, Okay, so next year, 2008, we reported the first fully solid state perovskite photovoltaic cell. It's a conference uh, took place in Hawaii. Uh, we, we reported we could solidify the perovskite sensitized solar cell uh, in fully solid state uh, structure by using a carbon conductive polymer as a a whole, co whole, whole, whole conductor, but efficiency is so poor because we are using this perovskite as a kind of quantum dot by thinning the thickness and this absorber, it's not sufficient to absorb the sunlight. Automatically, combustion efficiency is so poor. Uh, this is the first pu published paper, 2009, showing the perovskite sense size uh, photoelectrochemical solar cell showing uh, efficiency of 4%, but stability of very poor. Then, they, in Korea, only one professor uh, 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 followed our uh, 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 work and uh, uh, increased the efficiency over 6%. She also tried the solidification of this cell that showed efficiency 9%, but in, it, 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 it's in 2012, but the same year, uh, 
our co collaboration succeeded in uh, enhancing efficiency in 10 percent this is the start of worldwide perovskite research okay so this is some photographs Henry Snaith, Nangyu Park and this is Takumura Kabi and Mike Lee is a student of uh, Henry Snaith. So what is very special for the perovskite crystals this is a mixed ionic and cobalt nature this is ionic crystalline because of having the halide here <clears throat> and the absorption power, uh, absorption coefficient is very, very, very high, 10 to the 5. So only one micron thick film can totally absorb the instant light. And uh, band gap is tunable by changing uh, composition of hair light, and we can synthesize the material at low temperature, and there was a, a fortunately so called defect tolerance nature. This is benign nature of defects. And cost material is very, very cheap. Roughly, one square meter large perovskite film cost just two dollars. This is spectral sensitivity. Here we have the top semiconductor, gallium arsenide, uh, capable of 28 or 30 percent. Perovskite here, 25. This is silicon. silicon. Silicon can produce very high current density, but the voltage output is very low. So the product of current and voltage is a, a power. So uh, oppositely, perovskite photo current density is lower, but voltage is high. So the result is the silicon perovskite, the power generation almost same level in the, at the efficiency 26 percent. But what is the difference between perovskite and silicon? Silicon is unable to produce sufficiently high voltage at low intensity light. If the intensity of light became one-tenth against uh, sunlight, so this is a quick uh, drop in uh, uh, voltage. That leading to the drop in efficiency cycle. But perovskite can maintain this high, uh, sufficient high voltage, so perovskite uh, photovoltaic cell can work even in indoor illumination. Or of course, in a rainy day and a cloudy day. Because of the defect of tolerance, the defect, uh, impurity defect, is uh, form, forming relatively shallow trap here. So trap assisted, assisted recombination of charge is very, very uh, suppressed in case of perovskite cells. But silicon and galvanized trap is very deep. So the low intensity light, the current density can be decreased. So we can show this uh, defect tolerance by the sh shining the perovskite layer by UV light. So the it, uh, solvent is evaporated and crystalline formed. We can see the vivid uh, light emis uh, emission from perovskite crystals. This is a bromide cross perovskite. Uh, and coating with easy, this is uh, how to coat a perovskite thin film by slot die coater. And we also developed the special inkjet printer with collaboration of uh, Wakayama Prefecture based company, Kishu Kigen. They developed the special ink and head of uh, the printer. So now we can um, print any kind of letter and de design on plastic and glass electrode. This is a, 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 it's a, a outer structure of perovskite sandwich cell. And we need to use the whole Whole, trans whole selective layer and electro selective layer to enable efficient charge separation to pro uh, pro get the photocurrent density. So this is section view. Perovskite is very, very thin, 0.5 to point maybe one micron thick. So with this thickness, all instant light is ab ab absorbed. Because of very, very thin, we can make a very thin film uh, uh, device on the plastic, it's bendable, and no cracks can be produced because of the very, very thin film. So, but engineering is very difficult. Just by evaporating solvent, we have to make highly packed, large grain polycrystalline layer. 
if we uh, we could not make a large grain, here is a grain boundary area, rich of defect. So we like to make this kind of layer. How can we make this kind of layer? Just coating the solvent. This is very high tech technique for the makers, the company. Uh, very fortunate uh, element is the voltage is very high because this uh, voltage loss in the band gap is relatively uh, 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 small for perovskite. <coughs> but the defect, by a minimizing defect, we can further increase the photovoltage. Now we are now focusing on how to enhance the voltage uh, by uh, tuning the grain size, increase the grain size that indicate the decrease in the grain boundary area. So this is one example by doping the underlying scaffold TiO2 with alkali cation, calcium, potassium, uh, sodium, we, 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 we could see the change, big change of grain size. This is chemistry, 100% chemistry. So by succeeding this, we, we could increase our photovoltaic here and further so-called the interfacial passivation by some small organic, organic uh, molecule. This can passivate this uh, grain boundary surface to reduce the trap-assisted recombination. The material is with the caffeine, the amino acid, and fluorine. Interesting. Very interesting. And this is some typical material, uh, phenylethylamine. We coat the interface of perovskite with this one to generate the dipole, this is a field at the interface, to shift the whole transport material's work function. The result is we could get a relative high voltage, 1.19, but that gap is relatively low, 1.51. That indicates voltage loss deficit is limited to 3 me. 100 millivolts. It's very, it's very, very low. So this kind of theoretical, close to theoretical limit of uh, photovoltaic, uh, we could get an efficiency over 22 percent. But now we are tackling all inorganic cell, the free of organic because of very high thermal stability. So this is the materials: the cesium, lead, mixed halide. But this one actually first synthesized in the late 19th, 19th centuries. Yeah. Now we are doing this one at a uh, light absorber. This is a conductive polymer uh, supplied by Mitsubishi Chemical Company. And the result is this. The, under sunlight, efficiency was not very high, 70%. But the, okay, but the photovoltaic increased to 1.4. This is relatively high photovoltaic which from the single single solar cell. For example, uh, 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 silicon solar cell, this voltage is 0 0.7 to 0 0.8. It's, it's very high voltage. And we could further enhance efficient uh, photovoltaic exceeding 1.5 by participating the iodine defect by using this kind of uh, organic materials. Interesting news is if we, uh, we expose the device to indoor LED light, power commodity efficiency reached over 30%, 30%, because there's a very good matching between the light emission spectrum and absorption uh, spectral sensitivity. So there is no loss in harvesting light in indoor, because it is a, a visible light sensitive uh, photovoltaic cell. So based on this result, we are, uh, uh, are now uh, working on indoor application of, of perovskite uh, in addition to outdoor application, indoor. <coughs> yeah. So, but we have to uh, establish the low temperature uh, process. For example, the TiO2 or tin oxide 
we have to uh, make our best porous area uh, relatively low temperature. This is uh, by using a dihydration reaction, same as the cement, cement making. So we are using a plastic film. The, uh, my company, Pexel, is now supplying the plastic film with very low uh, uh, surface resistance, 12 to 15 uh, ohm per square. So our top efficiency was 21% uh, for the plastic-based flexible perovskite solar cell, participated by alutemisimin. This is an anti-malarial drug. Uh, <clears throat> So this is a video. We started with plastic, fixing plastic film on the grass stage, and this is a spin coating machine. machine. To accelerate the crystallization, we dripped the anti-solvent, so-called chlorobenzene. So we can, you can see a darkening color here. This indicates the production of heroic so This is not, but not perfect. Then we re removed the plastic film to move to the hot plate to further heat the film up to 100 degrees Celsius. Then we can see the quick change of color to the black. Just in two, three seconds. Let's go. Yes. So finish. The silicon solar cell, they need 1,400 degrees Celsius, taking more than four hours. But perovskite, the film making is very, very quick. And also, uh, low cost. Uh, yes. So China now also on, only one company is using uh, this large module. Yeah, this is a China-made large module. Thickness is one millimeter, mm. but efficiency is still low, nine percent. So we believe we Japanese engineers can make a much better efficiency module. Uh, by using the technology of Japan, this is a semi transparent one. And roll to roll process can be applied to, uh, uh, to increase the speed of uh, fabrication. Many companies in the world are now tackling the perovskite solar cell business. This is in Poland, some technology, and sexy chemical now very popular in Japan, Toshiba and Kaneka. They are uh, prone to make. Uh, flexible lightweight solar cell. But China is <laughs> extraordinarily uh, rich country. They, I, I just photographed this uh, data in the uh, uh, academic conference. This showed 80%, this is almost one meter large. But surprising this one, this year, the major silicon company, just few, last year, is uh, up here on the internet. The efficiency is 80%, the size is one meter, two meter, semi transparent. In Japan, same efficiency is obtained just 30 centimeter large one by Panasonic. So this is a fact. But very few companies there is working with plastic lightweight. Difficulty is how to make a very uniform layer because after coating, the crystallization occurring. We have to control the, to change uneven quality to uniform quality. This is very, very, needs very high technique and know-how in company makers. Space applications are also very uh, active in the uh, world. We started there in Japan, uh, showing the very high the tolerance against the high energy particle irradiation, like proton and, uh, and, uh, and electron. And that's, this show very high stability against uh, proton irradiation. And 10 to the 15 dose of uh, exposure of the device to the uh, proton irradiation still make the device survive. But at this level, the commercial Caribbean based satellite satellite device tends to be <coughs> destroyed. <clears throat> Why? Because absorbers are very, very thin, and high energy particles can penetrate without stopping inside. We also studied the lead-free new materials. Yes, we have to finish now. 
this is introduced chlorophyll derivative sensitive TIO to electron to absorb the season red bismuth uh, bromide free of lead. This is also new materials. It's unpublished data. We are now submitting this paper. This is sulfide uh, si 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 silver bismuth one solution coated process. And further, recovery of uh, lead from the cell. We started some new experiment to show how the surface perovskite layer is easily removed to recover. This is homogenizer. Just supposed to one and a half second, all total layer is removed, removed. yes. Mm. This is very good news mm. for recovery. Also, iodine is important source, only available in Chile and Japan. Mm. And I found some iodine maker in Japan is actually, actually uh, recovering the, the iodine for used things. Mm. Okay, this is my book. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this um, brilliant introduction showing the historical development, but also the important thing that solar PV technology shall not only be evaluated with one, va one variable. There are many dimensions of what creates the mm. value of a solar technology. And it's not just one that will prevail. There will be many operating in parallel. Yes. So thank you very much. We go over to the Swedish development, and Anders Hagfeldt, who is now Vice-Chancellor of Uppsala University, has a long background in solar energy technology development, and we leave the floor to him, and then we can have a dialogue between the two of you. Anders, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll see if I... Um, no, so let's see. Oh, is this, this one. Is it here? Or? No, no. We go out? Yeah, go out. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. I think we need the expert Tom. <laughs> Let's do. switch to that. Oh, it comes to my talk somewhere. And then it's this. Thank you very much, and thanks for the invitation from Eva. Uh, and I'm also an Eva member since uh, several years. So I'm very happy to be here. And nice to see you, Tom, again. Uh, good friend since many, many years. Uh, also, Mr. Ambassador, very nice to see you. Uh, so um, I, I will come back a little bit to what Thomas said about the. Uh, what's really going on in the solar world in the big picture and it's I would say it is really a revolution and I'll give you some numbers so this is how it can look like of course and uh, uh, this is the roof of economic in, uh, economic in Uppsala University. This is the largest plant, I think, uh, over two gigawatt, uh, which in power would correspond to two nuclear power plants. And this is, I found on the internet, if you want to buy a solar panel, cost about 4,000 crowns here in Sweden, and 25-year uh, warranty and so on, 20% efficiency. So that is a little bit how it looked like. Uh, for you, those of you who think about installing solar cells, these are some, at least in Sweden, maybe useful numbers. Uh, we actually use the sun as a unit. We call it one sun when we have one light intensity of a sun. So it's standardized. It's 1,000 watt per square meter and with a specific spectrum, which we call RMAS 1.5. Uh, so that means if you have 20% efficiency, you get 200 watts of a square meter solar panel. And in, so in Sweden, we have about 1,000 sun hours per year. So then you can calculate that this is 
200 kilowatt hours per year from one square meter. Uh, I will um, correlate uh, what's happening with nuclear power plants and uh, then you can remember that an average nuclear power plant like Forsmalk is about one gigawatt in power. If you want to go to energy and compare nuclear and solar, you use maybe a factor of five or six because the sun is of course uh, not up all the time and if you say that we have 8,000 hours per year and uh, nuclear power plants work 24-7, then it's a factor eight to correlate power and energy. Um, so this is the solar revolution we're coming to. So if you look into the accumulated installation of solar cells globally, we are at the end of 2022 at about 12, 1200 gigawatt, which in energy uh, correlates to about 150 nuclear power plants. Uh, if we take a factor of eight in difference between power and energy. And this installation, if you look into the curve here, doubles every three years about. And you can also then see here that where it's installed, China dominates, Europe not so bad, USA, India is coming up quite a lot. If we take these numbers per year instead, uh, we will see installation of solar cells per year. In 2022, it was installed 240 gigawatts, which in uh, nuclear power plants you divide then, as I said, by five to eight. Uh, 2023, I don't have exact numbers, but it's around 400 gigawatt. That means, and that's the solar revolution, uh, we, the installation of solar electricity today is at the speed of about one nuclear power plant per week. That's how fast it goes. And this doubles every three years. So where are we 20 years from now if it continues? Uh, if it continues, we will have so much electricity that we have to think about what to use it for, more or less, I think. But that's the speed of it. One nuclear power plant per week installation. Um, this is also a very important figure, and that is, of course, what is, does it cost to produce the uh, power? I started my uh, journey of solar cells as a PhD student around here, 1990. Then it costed, and the unit we use is dollar per peak watt. How much dollar does it cost to produce solar panels, which produce one watt in power? So at that time it was 10 watt, uh, 10 dollar per watt, and this was the. Uh, argument for solar energy research at the time. We need to look into new technologies because silicon will, is at least 10 times too expensive and will always be too expensive. That's how we started our application. And we did that for about 20 years in our applications. So you see here that one dollar was the, was the target and that happened around 2012 or something like that, uh, which was a surprise. And that's China, of course, to scale it up. So uh, nowadays, uh, and I, uh, nowadays we can't use that argument anymore. Silicon is very cheap. That's the that's the fact. So we have to look into other uh, uses of solar oil, uh, as uh, Miyazaka uh, San showed us that uh, we we are with emerging technologies as good as silicon, perhaps. But the price today in production cost is less than 20 US cents per watt. That's just an enormous uh, development, and that means also that to produce electricity, the cheapest way is to do it by solar in the most part of the world, actually. So that's a little bit of the, of the um, solar revolution. But of course, solar is intermittent. So of course, we, use, we see that in Sweden, of course, uh, over winter. So we need also to work on storage. And I will not say much more about that because Christina will take over on that side, of course, with the batteries. But you can do that in different ways. So uh, Tom already showed us uh, the world record of different types of solar cells. Uh, silicon is the conventional one, used more than 90% of the solar cells are silicon. So 26.8 as a world record. Uh, the perovskite is this black curve which started with Tom's work here, uh, 2009, uh, the publication, and then steeply 
is up to 26 uh, percent and then compares well to, to the silicon inefficiency and it can be used as a tandem as Tom also showed at 34 percent with if you combine silicon and perovskite. Uh, Disensitized cell as I will show you is at the water record at 13 percent. I will touch upon this technology also because that is the sort of mother technology of the perovskite cells as well uh, and that world record is actually based nowadays quite a lot on the chemistry we developed in Uppsala some years back. Um, so if I go to myself, these are my research areas, the disensitized cells. I say a few words on this and a few words on the perovskite. I will not talk about solar fuel, although that's also a very exciting area coming up. Um, so let me introduce the disensitized cell in a little bit different way than, than Tom did. Uh, you can do it yourself. Uh, so I, we normally invite you to the lab to make uh, your own solar cell in um, an hour or so. So uh, that's also a, a virtue, I think, of disensitized cell because you can go with it to the school and kids can start to play around and do that. Uh, so this was a solar cell kit we developed some years back uh, where you have the ingredients. This is our contacts. You need to be a transparent contact, a glass with a conducting layer. Uh, we have uh, the titanium dioxide, white powder. We have the electrolyte with an iodide salt. And then we have a scotch tape to prepare them and some contacts. You have a pencil. Uh, the lab for high school students this was developed for should then build their own solar cell and drive the calculator as, as their sort of delivery, if we say so. There is one ingredient missing and that's the dye itself. And that's where the fun part of the uh, lab, lab starts. So here is how you can do it then. You start with your conducting glass, you put the scotch tape for the film thickness and to, uh, to, to have the contacts here. You have a solution of the titanium dioxide nanoparticles which you deposit and spread out. You heat, heat, them, heat it up, that's a step here with a, with a fan and then you take your electrode into the dye solution. This is the fun part of the lab because the students have to find their own dye molecules. Uh, and then you can try raspberry works well, blackberry works even better, strawberries not so good, for example. Now we saw coffee also can work. So, so you can try a lot of these things. Uh, the cathode is done by graphite from the pencil. So then you have your photoelectrode and the graphite and you fill it up with electrolyte with, and clamp it together, contacts, and you have your solar cell made. Uh, this is how it works a little bit. You have a nanostructured, high porous, high surface area. That's the trick. So you can have a monolayer of dye uh, uh, at, at a high amount, so to speak. So uh, that's the photoelectrode. You have impregnate with the electrolyte solvent and the iodide, for example. So you shine light, you excite the dye molecule, you inject the electron into the titanium dioxide particle. This was a mystery when it was started. People even didn't believe it should work. Uh, but I, I will not go into that. But it's a lot of fun to, to develop how this solar cell actually works. But the transport goes through all these particles to contact, do electrical work, goes to the plus, uh, the cathode, and then uh, you reduce the electrolyte and you bring the electron back to the dye and you close the circuit. And, but here you have so much chemistry to do. That was also the nice part of this technology. You can imagine all the organic synthesis people to develop new dyes. You have nanoparticles in organic chemistry, electrochemistry, electrolyte, semiconductor physics. You combine a lot of things into this technology and that makes it a lot of fun to work with. Uh, so there is, that's the, how it sort of developed over time with many, many development. So I will make a long uh, jump now to say this is state of the art. Uh, the iodide and the ruthenium complexes was state of the art for almost 20 years in this technology. Uh, but then in Uppsala we started to work on uh, uh, decreasing the internal potential drop using other materials. So state of the art at the moment is these organic dyes. Uh, with copper complexes as redox couples and that we developed in Uppsala and this is the world record we took at EPFL when I was there. So the world record is about 13% uh, 
and also very interesting for consumer electronics. Uh, you can imagine that you play around with integration, different colors, uh, and you suit it to the light sources and so on. So that's an area of applications, and it can look like this, for example, with flex flexible cells. This is the Exidir company in Stockholm. This is the um, Congress Hall in, at EPFL, and so on. Uh, well, over the years, uh, this technology allowed us, as I said, to play around with the chemistry. So you could work on, on the pigment, the dye system, how to absorb the light and inject electrons to TiO2. So one thing here is that you can not only use molecules, you can use pigments like perovskite, for example, which started with, with Professor Miyazaka. Uh, but you can also work on the electrolyte side and develop uh, solid state hole conductors and other electrolytes. And this combination was then the breakthrough for perovskite. Use uh, the perovskite together with the hole conductor. And uh, here I have my favorite picture of my friend Tom. <laughs> he's, I should tell you, he's a very good uh, violin player as well. And he gives concerts so every now and then. And this was when we had our conference 2014. That's early days of the perovskite when we had a nice skiing trip as well in Hokkaido. Um, what, what is also nice with the perovskite, I, now I didn't have the picture, that is that you also here have a lot of chemistry to do. You have the A site, that's a cation, which started with the methyl ammonium. But you can play around with that. You can have cesium, as you said. You can have formamidinium. You can work on the lead site and put in some tin instead. And you can work on the iodide side, which changes the energy levels, the band gap. So you can tune a lot of properties. And also, the quality of the perovskite film is very important, as you can imagine. And the quality has a lot to do with the groove mechanism of the perovskite layer. And that you fine tune by basically by the geometry of the sizes of the ions, so it fits into the perovskite crystal structure. So that is something we worked a lot with at EPFL, to start to mix in cesium, formamidinium, methyl ammonium. So a lot of complex chemistry in a way, but it's very easy just to add salt in the solution and you start to, to combine. So that is some, some direction we had at EPFL. You can also work on the contacts, and, and Tom mentioned the Hulk transporter. Uh, this is uh, uh, quite recent work we did uh, where we worked on the electron contact instead and started to use quantum size tin oxide uh, just as the Nobel Prize uh, last year uh, with, the, with the quantum dots. These are quantum dots of tin oxide to accept electrons and then you can tune the energy levels to optimize so you do avoid any kind of energy level uh, drops internally. So here we had uh, I think Quite world record efficiency. This goes fast. It's probably not world record anymore, but 23% uh, for a square centimeter and scale it up. So I was uh, coming to uh, a little bit of end. So in terms of price, in terms of efficiency, perovskite is really a challenger to silicon. The big thing now is stability. So a few words on that side. Uh, and here is what I just said. We are comparable and probably much cheaper in in silicon at scaling up, but what about the stability? And that's challenging. We have to go to 25 years. So how to work on that side? Well, you have a lot of defects which you have to passivate. Uh, it can be defects on, on uh, you have um, the uh, A site, the cation may be missing, so you have a vacancy, vacancy of the iodide at the surface, you have uh, uh, the cation, different places and so on. So there are work on molecules to passivate uh, defects and also to heal uh, the uh, perovskite layer and there's been a lot of molecules around. I will just mention our latest results which comes from my postdocs Bowen and uh, Jaya at the Ångström lab. Um, so they started to introduce a new molecule, which is a sulfonium molecule, very difficult. The one breakthrough is just to work on solubility, find the right solvent. But this works as a passivation molecule, and they have tried that for various reasons uh, and tests, and that was published a month ago now. And I think it's almost like a record instability. So you can imagine there's a lot of 
things you can do. This layer with the sulfonium blocks uh, the surface, so we avoid uh, penetration of water, so it stands humidity. Uh, you avoid diffusion uh, out of iodine from the perovskite layer, so you block that, that's a, that's a problem. You avoid metallic contact diffusion, so it's a very solid layer on the surface. And then you also passivate uh, sites, which leads to recombination. So with these materials, uh, we have achieved uh, an excellent stability. This is now measured continuously, uh, so it is under load 24-7 for uh, continuously for almost 5,000 hours, and you see it's a straight line. This is at room temperature, so that's, that's I have to admit. We have to do this at 85 degrees as well. So, and we have done it at 45, but uh, still there is, there is uh, yeah, uh, question marks to solve. But if we take this line, we, uh, a number which indicates stability is T80. How, how long time does it take to degrade the cell to 80% of the initial value? And that is for this uh, test and the continuous operation nine years, which would correspond to about 70 years lifetime in Sweden. So that is, of course, extremely promising. Uh, and and uh, we are very happy about that result. Um, my final thing, uh, coming back to the question, well, uh, disensitized cells, organic cells, other technologies, perovskite, they were invented in Japan, they've been invented in, in Europe uh, and in Korea. Uh, but where is the industry? Well, it is in China. Uh, so this is the manufacture. Where is it manufactured? You see different uh, part of the silicon cell, wafers, cells, the modules, the material itself is to 80-90% manufactured in China. So I wanted to end that for the panel discussion. What do we do in Europe, Japan, in Sweden to keep our inventions? With that, I say thank you for your attention. Thank you, Anders. <laughs> Hearing your lecture, I wondered, why do you waste your time being a vice chancellor? <laughs> you have so much more important things to do than controlling things. Professor, please come back, and we have 10 minutes for a little dialogue and discussion. But then, Yeah, you can stand here. Or, yeah, yeah so. take that. Take the, the yeah. tables. You might want them. Uh, one little observation was that you, you both showed examples of how these dyes involved could be drinkable, mm -hmm. uh, indicating they're not very poisonous and, 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 and so on. But when you do the high efficiency applications, then how are the chemicals from sort of environmental point of view? Yeah, I can start. Well, okay, that's an issue, uh, of course. Uh, we, in the beginning, for dye cells, it was ruthenium complexes, which was used state-of-the-art for 15, 20 years. I would say now we have a lot of families or, or organic dyes, so they are uh, the ones we use now are fairly okay, I would say. Uh, but, but you're right. I mean, f the fun thing is to use something you can drink or eat, uh, but if you really want to have high efficiency and stability, not the least, mm. uh, then you need to design them and, 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 and make them. But we had a project many years ago uh, with Brio to make toys, uh, because they were interested in flexible cells as we, as we did it. Uh, but the criteria for them was that you could, should basically be able to eat the, <laughs> the solar cells. So we worked with that. Um, but it's an issue, for sure. Professor Miyazaka, you, you showed a little experiment where you indicated it was easy to recycle the materials. You could mm. easily dissolve them and use them again. Mm. Uh, will that also apply for, for real industrial products? Could that help making these systems even more sustainable? Yes, I, I, I believe so. Mm. Uh, very few groups are working on, on the recovery of lead and iodine. But now it's becoming very, very important. important. Hmm. Okay. I, I can yes. add one thing. I was just talking with a colleague. Uh, we have a project here in Sweden to see if we can use lead from car batteries uh, to re make lead iodine. And the, the number, and we, we can, we have developed the chemistry to do it, or not, we, I, I have not done it, but uh, 
The numbers are very interesting. If you take a car battery, say that it's a 10 kilo of lead, I think we say that one gram, order of magnitudes, one gram of lead makes one square meter, mm. about. So with one car battery, you make 10,000 square meters of solar cells. Yes, yes, that's right. That's about one megawatt. <laughs> So if you want to build a nuclear power plant with, with the lead, you need uh, about, th uh, in power, you need about 1,000 uh, car batteries. Uh. So you, we have, the, the lead is, <laughs> we do have, I think. Lead is also very, very cheap. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Regarding the lifetime, there are many variables, temperature, radiation, intensity, and things like that. And you, you described it as something that was long lifetime, stable, but you started off saying it was a, a difficulty, and you described the space ah. exposure to high ah. energy uh, radiation as something that where a pair of sky would have the great basic research, advantage. Research. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. But do you think this will be a difficult challenge for the pair of sky cells, or is it solvable? Yeah, you, can, you start, or... <laughs> mm -hmm. so, if, 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 yeah. the, if can we solve the stability problem? Ah, uh, solve stability. Yeah. Well, because uh, eff efficiency enhancement study is almost being saturated, the whole the research group is doing uh, improvement of s stability. So many, maybe, I guess there is a, a people working on perovskite so, so exceeding uh, thirty thousand people working. Uh, most of people are focusing on yeah. stability. Yeah. So, in the future, stability of hyperskite, I believe, will reach the practical level. Not the same level as silicon, but close to silicon. Mm -hmm. well, I can also tell with what you normally told when you started to do perovskite as a dye sensitized cell, you used still the iodide electrolyte. And I remember you said you had to run to make the measurement before it degraded in a few <laughs> minutes. So from a few minutes to at least now uh, possible years is, is a big, big step. But uh, um, uh, yeah, I think it's solvable, but uh, the silicon is a very good technology. It's a strong, strong contender, I must say. 25 years warranty is tough. If there's anyone in the audience who wants to pose a question, you're welcome to do so. Uh, those who are watching the streamed version cannot interact, but if anyone in the audience wants to pose a question, use the microphone, because otherwise they won't be able to follow. Should be close to you. Yes, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, so the, the efficiency is... Uh, of uh, well, the, all of them. Well, not so much the DSSC, but the others have all increased. Do you think that development will continue? Will the efficiency continue to go up, or are we close to where the, t the like the peak is? Yeah, but not very speedy. Uh, the still efficiency will be improved slow, slowly, especially by making a so-called tandem cell. The combination of three cons the perovskite, but I personally think the important thing for companies is the, the single perovskite cell already reached the 20 percent for small cell, but by increasing the area, the efficiency drops down to 15 percent. Now we have company work to uh, reproduce the high efficiency uh, comparable with a small cell by developing a coating coating system. This is more important, I think. Yeah, I can also say if you take one, one absorber solar cell, like one perovskite or one silicon, then you have a thermodynamic limit, which is called the shockley quiser limit, and that is around 31, 32 percent. So for one cell, when we say 26, 32 would be the thermodynamic limit. Uh, the gallium arsenide is then the best still at 28, 29 percent. Uh, so I think there is, because in terms of quality factors, uh, like you mentioned, uh, the photovoltage, we are better than the silicon. So there is, the quality is, is as good almost as gallium arsenide. So there is room, and, and what gallium arsenide made from 26 to 28 was to work with light management. So it's also to work on the optical side, I think. But this also means that, that uh, they emit light very well. 
So you, there's another big uh, work and development for perovskite is as LEDs actually also as well. So they 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 do. And but then if you go to two absorber like the tandem, then you have 42 percent as the thermodynamic limit. And so there are ways to passing the that and, and the 34 percent is the perovskite silicon tandem at the moment as a record. But there's been a lot of work to increase the efficiency in in in. Uh, watt per square meter or mm. per uh, insulation mm. but there's also the watt per dollar measure that mm. might be even more important because mm. there is quite a lot of space globally mm. Mm. Uh, so uh, how will perovskite compete compared to, to silicon in that development what do you foresee compete it's not, a, not a, it's not a necessary to compete now <laughs> no, but will because it become cheaper perovskite, than silicon yeah, cells but in future if if the perovskite uh, stability uh, became close to the level of silicon, so I think the all silicon cells will, will be re re replaced by perovskite because there is no uh, demerit for perovskite. Everything is very good. It works under rainy day, cloudy day, and uh, flexible and high voltage, everything is uh, better than single, mm. except the stability now. Mm. Right. I, you got the I, question there? Please tell who you are also, that might be interesting <laughs> to someone. Doesn't work? That's it? Marek Rubel from uh, Royal Institute of Technology and uh, Uppsala University. Uh, thank you very much for this exciting talks. Uh, you mentioned the problem of stability. So with the current day technology, how often would you have to change the panels? Uh, because uh, as you mentioned uh, in your uh, talks, uh, for silicon, this is 25 years guarantee. So how this compares when the panels are really exposed to atmosphere, not just staying in the laboratory? Yeah, uh, that's, that's, the, that's a critical question. And I remember we discussed how, because we do accelerated tests, as you say, in the laboratory, and how, how does that uh, trans, transfer to the real test? The, the answer is that it's unclear. We don't really know, I think. So I think in reality, you actually need to, to go outside and really do the proper test and see how they go. But in the lab, we have to test them hard and test the accelerated. There is one property of the perovskite which is very interesting, and that is that it's, it, it likes to take a night, uh, good night's sleep, as we say, because uh, there is sometimes you see an initial decay of the efficiency uh, when you shine light on it, and then it stabilizes, and then you switch it off, and then they, it comes back to the initial value. So it goes down a little bit, stabilize, and then you switch off, it goes up again, and it goes up and down. So it's a reversible uh, thing which we, uh, we, which we think we understand, but uh, that means also that it's very difficult to do proper accelerated testing. If you have that property, how do you take that into account? I, I can also add one thing on the on the on the what per because one thing with the silicon is that in, in principle if you look on materials cost if you do production perovskite should be much cheaper than silicon silicon is very challenging single crystals and uh, but the thing is that it's scaled up so, so that's mm. a scaling factor so how do you make if you want to compete uh, on the price today you need to build a huge factory, basically, to, to comp compete with the Chinese factories. And who is willing to put that money in Europe or Japan on yes. the table? That, that's, that's a real issue. So what, what is the entrance? And then build up, scaling it up. That's, that's a challenge, I think. Thank you. Michael? Uh, thank you. Uh, Michael Jacob here from IVA. Uh, thank you both for most interesting uh, presentations. And I'm also curious on the stability issue mm. uh, when it comes to the perovskite, and I'm interested in hearing more reflections uh, concerning this. And I noted in both of your presentations 
here uh, with the titanium oxide, and since this is photocatalytic, mm -hmm. uh, does this affect also the stability, and would there be anything else to use? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, as a photocatalyst, uh, some studies show that TiO2 can de de decompose perovskite, then that, that case we can switch to use uh, tin oxide, the less photoactive active. But actually, the damage by TiO2 is not, not so large as expected. How do you think about it? No, I, I agree with that. I think TiO2, for dye sensitized, we obviously need to use a UV filter uh, because otherwise it degrades the dye as a photocatalyst. For the perovskite, we um, we, and we are, the best ones are not using TiO2 anymore. The best contacts on the, elect on the electron side is the uh, tin oxide. Or Then you can also turn it around. There's so, there's so much flexibility in the perovskite. So you can also have... Uh, so if, if we have the electron contact where the light comes through, you use tin oxide, perovskite, and the whole transporting medium. But then you can turn it around so you have the whole side where the light. And then you use typically a polymer or a nickel oxide. And then you have uh, carbon-60 as an as a electron contact. So, and they are a bit more stable, I think. Now you have to update my... Yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah. Mm. So, and they have... They are also coming up in efficiency to 25, 26%. So, mm. so there's a lot of varieties, um, which is good for academics, but maybe difficult mm. for the industry, I would think. Right. Thank you very much for these two presentations and the dialogue. Give them an applause. <laughs> and while Christina is climbing the, uh, the, the stage, I would like just to point out that you showed Anders Exeger as one of the examples of industrial application. And that's also a good ex example of Japanese-Swedish collaboration because there are Japanese investors involved in Exeger. So uh, that's one good example of how collaboration can work. Good. Now we're going on to show that it is not just a matter of a technology or one technology. It's a matter of many technologies and system development and batteries will contribute in this system development where solar cell plays a key role. Christian Edström, one of the key researchers in battery developments in Europe. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador and ladies and gentlemen. Professor Tom, if I may say so. It's a great honor to be here. I was myself, uh, I had a stipend from JSPS uh, more than 20 years ago. It was an extremely important uh, um, experience for me and my family. So I, I remember that uh, time in Scuba Science City as something very, very important for my development. And uh, you have now plunged into really details in uh, solar cells, and I will give you more an overview of where we stand on the battery side or uh, store storage of energy from voltaics. And uh, Japan was early. I mean, you had the Nobel Prize 2019. Dr. Yoshino actually was here on one of these meet, uh, excellent seminars, top research seminars. And uh, before the Nobel Prize and talked about his invention, the lithium-ion battery. Uh, but I must tell you that the research came actually from Europe and that started already in 1970. So it, it was already then, you can see a nice uh, co collaboration. Um, Japan was then early in, in uh, commer commercialization of these batteries. Uh, and Europe started to wake up around 2017 extremely late. But I think this, uh, this plot here can show you why. Um, this is a, from the World Economic Forum 2019. And this is the expectation of how the amount of uh, the growth of batteries that are needed globally and how that would, would distribute between different uh, areas of, of our world. And you can see that Europe has an, uh, some substantial part of it. But just as the solar cells uh, are made in China, also batteries are primarily made in China and to some extent also in Korea and uh, also in Asia, I could say, also with Panasonic in Japan. But, but then it was a worry, will our volumes, the need we would have for our automotive, automotive industry um, 
leave us as small customers and not uh, achieving the batteries we need for the green transition to really have an, uh, uh, the electrification we need, electromobility. So that stirred a lot of, of actions at European level. And I think it's interesting, it, the driver of batteries is really the automotives, the transport side. But you can see that there is also an expectation from the energy storage side here. And looking at how it uh, actually turns out, if you go back uh, five years from now and look what we, th oh, sorry, what we thought at that time, and what we know now is that actually took, uh, the prediction is that it four times faster than we expected. And I think this is a sign that now renewable electricity is coming into the grids. The solar is coming and pushing this much faster than we expected, but also the wind power. So uh, this is really some, some uh, achievements, I would say. Uh, and the question is, of course, what batteries? And if you look at, I made a little white paper around 2011, and at that time, more than 99% of the energy storage in the world were pumped hydro. 0.3% were batteries. It was just some tests. If we go to 2020, we can see that the battery part has increased to 5% of the total storage capacity. And here, the lithium-ion batteries are the complete dominating one, followed by the sodium sulfur batteries. And you can see that in China, it's quite different because China has a different kind of grid and they have installed a lot more of new uh, and battery storage than, uh, than globally. And I think that's an interesting uh, sign also how, how our local systems will work. So the question is, what batteries for solar storage? And then I come into this question, what is a battery? To me, it's a battery cell that I open and I work and my research is about what's going on inside this cell. But the research could just as well be, how do we take all these battery cells and make a container of batteries? Because, and store that in a system, which is just as important. So the research today is very broad and very, very diversified when you talk about battery research. So this is just an example which I, found, I got from my colleagues in Lithuania, where the, we, the security situation we have now with the Baltic country trying to be less dependent on some of the neighbors that have previously supplied them with gas, for instance, that they actually try to uh, keep the quality in the grid by placing big battery uh, containers uh, like this uh, at a strategic position to, to keep the grid. It's like we did in Sweden, having nuclear power in south of Sweden because we didn't have the power. But we are also going more and more to a distributed battery energy storage system, BSS. And that is, of course, we, I have a solar cells on my garage. Should I have a battery uh, linked to that? Well, it could give me some kind of electricity security, but probably it's smarter to just sell, sell the electricity out to the grid again, as it is now. So it's these balances we are talking about. And there, I think there will be a lot of things happening. So uh, what are then the, the advantages of batteries? Why, why is, has it such an increasing importance for, for the storage? globally, well, they are flexible and scalable. You can move these, are you not happy with the containers where they are? You can actually move them somewhere else. And you can, <laughs> um, they have also high efficiency. Uh, if you look at all the parts, uh, you know, power electronics and tra transferring electricity in and out, it, it's about 80%, which is quite good. But of course, we have almost the same challenges as, um, as for the solar cells. How do we improve the amount of energy we can store in one battery cell to really reduce the size and the dependence on raw materials, for instance, in a battery? We have the lifetime uh, also, which is related, of course, to the cost of a battery. Uh, we have also the question on how long can you really store 
uh, energy and, and well, you can store it, of course, for a long time, but when you need to use the stored energy, it's not a question of that you can use that energy for a season. We are talking about perhaps 10 hours, can we push it up to one week it's in that neighborhood? And of course, since I am the, the research is, of course, still on lithium-ion batteries, though it was commercialized 1990 by Doc, uh, SI Chemicals and, uh, and uh, uh, together with Panasonic, um, we, have, uh, uh, we started in the 70s with lithium metal as a negative electrode and a metal oxide as a positive electrode and some kind of polymer which could uh, have the lithium ions moving back and forth between these electrodes. And what was Dr. Yoshino's uh, invention was that he realized that this is not safe, so we need to replace the lithium with some kind of host material. He started with the conducting polymer and so on, realized it should be a, a, a carbon material, and a little bit later it became graphite. And then you have uh, the other Nobel Prize laureate, uh, Stan Whittingham was here, but good enough, realizing that you needed a lithium-containing uh, material here that could uh, actually gi ha give you the lithium-ion batteries. And today we're working on our laws trying to get silicon, a very well-known material we have discussed a lot today, into the graphite to make this work better. For you, it looks like uh, some very few materials here. I talk about lithium cobalt oxide, a, a nickel cobalt manganese oxide, uh, an iron phosphate, for instance. But these, it's a whole playground of different chemistries and possibilities. So for an inorganic chemist, for me, it's really wonderful. But the main ones that we look at commercially are the ones containing nickel cobalt manganese or lithium iron phosphate for lithium batteries. And it's actually so that the cost influences which batteries you will employ for large-scale storage, stationary storage. And here comes the iron-containing material, the iron phosphate, LFP, that was super much studied more than 10, 20 years ago. And then it's sort of um, everyone went into the lithium, nickel, cobalt, manganese oxide because they give you more energy per volume than the lithium ion phosphate. But the lithium ion phosphate is a little bit more, sta more stable, it's a little bit more safe, and uh, you can actually play with engineering and increase the, the, um, the packs and modules, uh, the energy you get there. And then you can see, yes, in a few years, this is the material that's taking over and responsible for the growth of, of battery innovation <laughs> storage. And I'm saying this because what today the research on batteries is so rich with so many people coming in, looking at every possibility. So we're going back into history uh, and picking up things that we thought were forgotten and didn't work at that time and look at it again. And a lot of what we talk about is, of course, similar issues like the solar cells. Where do we find the critical raw materials? Do we need more mining? Uh, all these things, and where should we have it? And of course, lithium, cobalt, nickel, and graphite are some of these uh, uh, geopolitically different materials. So if we look now at, we have the lithium-ion battery there, what is the future and what can be the materials and what is the research we need to really make the uh, rechargeable batteries of the future? Well, I, I would actually like to come back to John Goodenough and say he once uh, published a paper about a compound called Prussian white with an iron-containing material for sodium batteries. And the Prussian white and Prussian blue materials are highly defective. If they will work as a material for batteries or not, depends on the atomic structure, how you do your synthesis. It's very subtle things to make it work. And uh, in my lab, I had this uh, postdoc coming in to me and say, we've done this. We have done it much better than John Goodenough did it. And I asked him why. Well, it's probably because, because we know how to make the bright synthesis to get really a good crystal structure of this. 
good, I said. I want to take a patent, he said. Go and do it, I said. And don't involve me. And he did. And a little bit later, they worked together in a little team. The other postdoc come in and say, I would like to make a company. And I say, do it, but don't involve me. Sometimes I think a supervisor should stay away from the creativity. And now we have a small spin-off company called Altris doing this material. And um, this, this is how the structure looks. And it has very nice, what you say, charge, discharge capacity curves, very flat, very simple. And uh, um, it is one of all these possible positive electron materials for sodium batteries, which is the next one we will see being commercialized more for the solar cell storage segment, because it will not be as high uh, energy content as you have with a lithium ion battery. So let us save the lithium batteries for transportation. And here, when the containers, it doesn't matter so much, let's go for something cheaper. So what we also learned, which is a message from Europe, is that um, they also did a lot of skunk work in the lab, which I didn't really know of. So they tried to upscale this. And that, uh, for every upscaling step, they had problems. And they needed to solve that. And there's a lot of research just to understand how do we do the upscaling processes. And this is something we are missing out a little bit now in the chemical engineering educations we have. We need to get that back because it's so important. Um, and when we came to 100 litres, they, they had moved out of the lab. Okay, so they kept it because this is expensive as well. So, um, yeah, <laughs> I just want to pay out that the sodium sulfur battery was really the start once upon a time. Myself, my, I did my PhD on the sodium conduction mechanism in this material. It's a sodium, a molten sodium, molten sulfur. You can make big, big uh, storage uh, uh, units of this, which is something they have done for a long time in Japan. And I kept that going since the 1980s when this was popular. But now it's coming back again, since we are looking at every technology again. And we start to build this kind of technologies again, just to distribute the risk of many different raw materials and, and uh, be uh, careful with this. Uh, lots of things, lots of interesting research to do within the battery. But I would like to end by saying a little bit what the European Commission and the, the Battery Partnership says in its we have just come out with a strategic research and innovation agenda, and it's very clear that the future battery EU calls will be targeting uh, mobility and stationary applications for the first time. It's been very much focused on transportation. Cost-effective next-generation batteries for long-duration storage is the key. But I would say that if you have one material and one component, it can change the whole sort of picture because it's always the chemistry in the battery that decides the outcome. So thank you for being patient. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you very much, Christine. And you showed so well how how the industrial development in, in Europe, as well as the rest of the world, is going. And, and during this period when you have been the scientific support for the industrial development in, in Europe, we should note that it's not negligible. Just looking at the battery manufacturing capacity being built in Sweden at the moment will likely result in the battery cell export from Sweden being bigger than the total forest industry export within three years. So it's, it's not a negligible transition that we are in. And we heard under showed that the total installed solar capacity two years ago passed one terawatt in power. The solar PV manufacturing capacity globally will be one terawatt within a few months. So it's a really dramatic change ongoing. Uh, Christina, when we talked about solar cells before, we talked about how it was not just one technology. There were many different mm. solar PV technologies that were suitable for different purposes. Mm. Isn't it the same for yes. batteries yes, that we will absolutely. have a, a range of different technologies? Yes, and that's why we still see the very mature and old lead-acid battery 
still being uh, equal in, in market shares as the lithium-ion battery, because uh, it has its virtues. We also, in Sweden, we export nickel-cadmium batteries with a profit. We should not forget that. Also for stationary application, because they have their sort of specific characteristics fitting for some kind of, of applications. So yes, and I think we need to continue to diversify because cobalt and other critical raw materials, but also the geopolitical reason you find uh, lithium in, in uh, South America, in Australia, Russia and China, you find a little bit in, in Scandinavia as well and in Portugal. But the sodium, for instance, you find everywhere. Yep. So things like that we have to think of. Mm. Thank you. Now we have a final panel that will deal with many of the issues and the system integration issues. We have uh, Ute Kappel from Uppsala, Maria Abramsson from Chalmers and Lisa Joransson from Chalmers. Welcome to the front. You have the table there to share. Um, we have 20 minutes, maybe give you a start to just uh, say a few words of what you think are the important topics for this transition that we have heard the solar and the battery part of, but you have also the system perspective, material science perspective and so on. Maria. Okay, uh, I mean, this is dangerous, Thomas, you know this, because one can speak about this forever. But, yeah, but um, I come up to you and I <laughs> put my hand but, on your head. Uh, you... I actually want to start with alluding a little bit to the question about efficiency in solar cells that Anders mentioned uh, very quickly. We, we talk about the thermodynamic limit, uh, which if I try to make it simple, has to do with that the materials don't absorb all photons. And that is actually something that we work with in my research group, how we can split a high energy photon into two photons. It's not really two photons, it's two charge carriers. And how we can merge two low energy photons and have them make one high energy photon so that we can get higher efficiencies and overcome this limit. And, and in one way, of course, you could argue that, you know, if if we are installing so much anyway, do we really need to make them more efficient? And I would say yes, from the materials perspective, uh, because we still, we still use a lot of scarce materials and you know, we want to do this as sustainable and as cheap as possible. So the phonon management will still be, I think, important because we need to keep down our materials use. So what per atom will correlate with what per dollar and therefore be important indeed. Uta. Okay, um, I think I have two points and one is um, kind of a little bit unrelated to research but this is where I think when we, we, on one hand we have all these solar cells being installed right now but we have to sort of, sort of as the society as a whole, we have to think about the systems around this. And I think there, scientists, it's important that we remember to go around and tell normal people how much solar cells is being installed now. Because I think, for example, in Sweden, if you listen to the public discussion, I don't think that that many people are aware of this, that if you look at where does electricity from, come from in Sweden, the only thing which is really growing right now is solar. And I think this is maybe... We're not so aware of this, and then we don't think about this, how we're going to include this in our whole systems. So this is the overall point of view. From a research point of view, I can kind of say what interests me personally, and this is that to, to really go in and get an understanding at the atomic level, what is going on in these devices. Um, and for this, we're developing new methods. And I think now we're coming to this point where we can actually understand these things in ways which we've never been able to do before because we're getting better and better at doing really sophisticated measurements and really gaining understanding of what's going on in detail. Thank you. Two important points. And Lisa, you've been dealing with how system integration can take part and the fact that it's not a technology, it's a system that's changing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I was noting down, so we're going from, from this lab scale that we're discussing and this deep chemistry and what happens then when we go large scale. Um, and as in many, in many things, when we look at this energy transition, I mean, the technology is there. 
Um, also, I think to a large extent, um, the transition is, is quite cheap, but it's still very difficult to, to, to get it going and making it happen. Uh, I was thinking about three things for the solar. Uh, the production, matching the production with the load, that's one challenge. Uh, we know that we have uh, the solar PV production is concentrated to a few hours, um, it's concentrated to daytime. Uh, and we need to, first of all, we need to, to, to be able to match that with the load, which is, of course, um, many, many other times as well. So can we move load or can we use storage? So that's one thing. Uh, then the material use and security of supply recycling. That's the other thing. Uh, I have some colleagues at Chalmers who work with battery development. And he was telling me when they work with new battery chemistries, uh, they looked at the, the, the periodic table and then they... They removed everything which was not non-toxic and abundant. And then they started from there. And it's like, okay, so this is what we can use. And this is the only things that we can use if it's going to be large scale and, and work on the large, this, this scale that we're talking about. Um, and then I guess we have also the land use issue that we should talk about. Um, that can also be a challenge for upscaling of solar. Maria, you, you talked about the importance of, of improving the material efficiency. Uh, how much is still to be done? How far are we from the sort of theoretical limits? What, what do you mean with theoretical yeah, limits? Exactly. What are the theoretical <laughs> limits? How much, how much lighter, how much fewer grams or atoms can we... Uh, be so able to, 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 to reduce it to, to produce electricity? What, what are, the, are the limits within sight? I mean, I, I, think, I think this is actually, this is a very complex question. Because, of course. Uh, this, of course, has to do with what we're willing to pay uh, and what kind of materials we're willing to use. So, so the driving force here is really, you know, it's like, you know, a gasoline engine is it's not very efficient. And we were happy with that for a long time, somehow, because it didn't cost us too much. And suddenly it started doing that, and suddenly we started realizing that this is not good for other reasons. So it's, it's hard to tell. And I mean, we talked about the thermodynamic limit, which is you know, a limit for how much a semiconductor can absorb in terms of photons. Mm. But we also talked about that there are ways to come around this. And this is, I think, the key to why science and research has to, even if it seems like a curiosity at a time, it's still worth pursuing because we don't know where it will have an impact. But we've been through an industrial learning process with diesel engines. They become ridiculously cheap after decades of, of development and very many being produced. We're in a process where, where the learning curve is still ongoing for solar PV uh, cells. Will it continue or have we reached, are we close to a physical limit? I invite also Anders and our <laughs> superstar here to, to do, do you see the limits being close, or is the learning curve going to continue, oh, or yeah. prices going to fall? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so power generation by solar cell, the element is uh, voltage and current, but current is almost close to the theoretical limit. Mm -hmm. It's the maximum. The voltage is still some space for improvement, but it's we coming to almost a theoretical limit, I think so. Uh, for so, sing, single cell, yeah. So the, the the cost will come down by another factor of ten, or just a factor of two, or how, how far are we from these limits for the learning curve and cost? Ah, uh, cost is uh, still still on the line. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anders. Yeah, I I so. I agree with that. I think the learning curve goes on for a while. Of course, there must be a limit <laughs> where you cannot. But but what happens with the thinking about the system is that there are other costs as well, uh, and that's why the efficiency is so important. Uh, so now, it, when I started, it, every every cost had to do with the materials of the solar cell, and then we have the rest, which is the inverter, how to transform from DC to AC. It's the installation cost. It's all kind of. 
the the uh, interest rate for for loans and so so that we call balance of system cost uh, and they were always um, neg uh, comparably not very high nowadays that's the cost really more than the solar cell cost so that means that to to decrease the system cost uh, it's difficult to do much so much with the cost of the solar cell specifically but it's very important to erase the efficiency of it that matters quite a lot so that's why we also work a lot on on improving the efficiency now we have more or less reached uh, the one absorber limit 26 percent uh, but i see an entrance for perovskite is in the tandem device where you really have uh, the gap to board record 34 percent and if you can make modules where at 25 26 percent uh, that that could matter actually yeah. I just heard that there is a spot market for solar panels in, in, in Europe, and some of you might look at that daily, but I, I heard that the price had roughly been cut in half since last, since last year. Mm. So it's definitely ongoing. Anders then said it's now the system cost that's the problem, and if we listen to anything in the Swedish energy policy debate, it's system costs, system yeah. costs, Lisa. <laughs> yeah, no, I was thinking, uh, when you started, I was thinking, okay, so first we have, at the moment, solar parks are cost-competitive in Sweden. So we get installations on the market, uh, and we can get that for a while, up until you kind of meet the load summer daytime, and then you kind of hit your first kind of boundary. Okay, so we meet the load summer daytime, now we don't get anything paid for our solar farms uh, from solar, solar solar parks anymore because we're basically uh, drop, uh, making the price go down completely what do we need now so now we need to either move load to these hours or we need batteries as Christina was pointing out so then batteries plus solar PV needs to be cheap enough so that you can meet uh, the load for the full day for example uh, or for longer time periods and and even that out so so it goes together with these other parts um, for wind power, we've also seen that there are other things where we kind of hit the limit now, which is kind of um, ancillary service costs and things like that, which are being the argument that these are going up because of you have lots of uh, non-synchronous generation being connected to the system. So this is another kind of boundary that we need to break as well. And there again, batteries become really, really important because also their batteries are kind of the key um, to deal with the, the ancillary services. Uh, they are ideal for many of the ancillary service purposes. And now finally we get also investments in Sweden uh, in batteries for this purpose. So um, I think there are several different boundaries in the system that we gradually need to break. Uh, and there are many like together costs, let's say, uh, that we need to take care of. And they need to be in combination cheap enough to continue to be competitive. This interaction between the basic research in material and technology on the one hand and the system integration on the other and, and understanding what are the demand. You, you sort of alluded to that with your two statements in the beginning. Mm. Well, how do you see it being done? Um, I think maybe for a long time we've done too little of it, where we, we sort of like to talk sort of really, because we like talking about our scientific details, right? We, this is what a lot of our scientists really enjoy to do. And then maybe we have forgotten to sort of look at the wider society's perspective. But I think now we have maybe more and more initiatives where we're trying to bring different people together. So, for example, I myself, I'm in an initiative, a Wallenberg initiative for sustainable materials, where we, we have regular meetings where we have people from different fields interacting and where we get our next generation of PhD students, they will see talks in these, in, um, in these meetings by people who, are, like, to give, who give them a broader perspective, where they see the aspects beyond their own research. So I think this, these sort of things are very important, that we have these events where we widen our perspective, where we start having these interactions and where we start having more projects where it is we work together um, yeah, to go beyond our own little bit of research. And if I can just add just, something yeah. very quick to that, because uh, one of these meetings that you are alluding to, it was also it was so clear that in certain aspects, industry is ahead mm. of us basic researchers. Uh, and, and in terms of how to think about sustainability and how to, you know, just as you said, Lisa, just exclude 
what we know won't be sustainable. Mm. And sometimes we tend to go back to our favorite elements and be like, it's a good model system. Mm -hmm. But we also need to stop doing that at some point and, and just say that, no, it's going to be iron. It's going to be carbon, oxygen, nitrogen is okay hydrogen, but not so much else. I mean, sodium is okay, I think, Christina, <laughs> but, but uh, we, we really need to think about this in mm. a way that we haven't done before. And we also need to, to be inspired by industry. And we are at the heart of the Royal Academy of Engineering Science. And our <laughs> purpose is to make sure that the dialogue between industry and academia works in this sector to make our industry competitive. Uh, Professor Masaki, you have a background where you partly worked industrially as well. Yes. Uh, that is not so common in Sweden. Is it more common in Japan that uh, university professors work part, part of their career in industry and then in universities? Well, it's not, it's not very popular in Japan, but uh, uh, Actually, it depends on the university, the private university. Many professors are actually coming from uh, companies. Mm -hmm. mm. So they have uh, many career in point of uh, publishing patents and uh, cost valuation. They are doing better. Yeah. Mm. Christina, you, you were saying to your students, go away, don't involve me, do it. <laughs> uh, but yes. at the same time, I know that you, 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 you are <laughs> quite supportive to the industry in other roles. How do you see this collaboration actually working in the battery development? I, I think it's, it's very interesting because uh, I, I started my career by going to a, a Danish lithium-ion battery. Oh dear, please put me on. <laughs> yeah. Is it on? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, well, my career started by going to Danish battery producing companies um, with lithium batteries. It, we had that in Europe <laughs> many, many years ago. And the, uh, the, the discussions we have with the industry can inspire really basic questions. You can explain things and phenomena because they don't want really to talk about the core activities, but they want the understanding. Uh, and that you can help with them with because you have more time for it. But then you also get your own creativity spurred, so you get m your own ideas to push from that. And I think what we're doing now is really trying to to have uh, this co type of competence centers where we actually formulate some of the research questions together. Uh, and I think that's very important. Yeah. I don't see a, a conflict between doing that and excellent research because you can play on both Right. You have two hands and two eyes and two feet, and I think you can make your body <laughs> out of that. Not impossible. Okay, we are soon to, to end. Uh, would you like to add a final comment to this audience? The conclusion of the day. Let's start from the other <laughs> side Well, not then. the conclusion of the day, but I was thinking because we got the question from the speakers before. So how do we make this industry now stay in, in Europe? Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, that's way out of my research field. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then I figured we, we, do, we do have this discussion about CBAM, this carbon, um, carbon border adjustment mechanisms to make sure that when we have requirements on CO2 reduction for basic materials in Europe, uh, we want our industry to stay and keep on being profitable in Europe while still living up to these targets. And I think if we like this market economy, we just need to specify the product better. I mean, what we're after better. And if we can specify that better, then maybe we can still have more open markets and, and open trade, but get what we want in a more total context, meaning that we get, well, solar cells, batteries produced, uh, in we, while being benign and sustainable long term and so on. Uh, but then we need to be better in, in our specifications, um, similar to something like, like SIBA for basic materials. Yeah. Uta? Um, I also want to relate to this point because what it got me to think this question, how do we um, compete with China? But then the other question which then came up to me was also related to re recycling because if we now buy solar cells, we have to some sort of ensure that we can, and we need to ensure that we can recycle them. But 
the important thing is we don't need to ensure that we can recycle them like very soon. We might need to recycle them in 50 years, right? And this is sort of how do we deal with this? And I think there we have to think about how can we actually do this? Because if we buy our solar cells from somewhere else and then that company doesn't exist anymore, how do we put this into our system? And this, yeah, I guess it might need regulation at a European level. Thank you. Maria? Yeah, okay, so uh, maybe some of you remember some of the gra graphs shown here earlier about solar cell development and also battery development. And if you, if you took a careful look, you saw that sometimes these developments were quite slow and sometimes very, very fast. And that is something that I want to leave you with in addition to what's already been said here, that we, we never really know when the breakthrough is going to come. Uh, and that's important to keep that in mind every time we say that, oh, no, this technology is never going to work. Because maybe it will, we just haven't seen the one transformative event just yet. Thank you, and applaud for the panel. And indeed, I think, looking back at development of new industries and technologies, Maria's final point is not irrelevant. It's very relevant. We often see things as something that will come, and then they don't come. And we wait, and we say, one day they come. And then suddenly we discover they have just arrived and passed us without us even noticing. And I think that is one of the challenges now in the development of this industry that a lot of things are already happening at remarkable speed and uh, many have not yet noticed and that is going to be a societal challenge in itself. I started off describing this rapid development and the need for collaboration between Sweden and Japan and we've had a few examples research cooperation and also some industrial cooperation that is happening and uh, I do think that the fact that we are able to co-organize an event like this between Japanese organizations and Swedish organizations in this room where collaboration between academia and industry is the key task for everyone here I would like to finally hand over the floor to His Excellency Nuke Masaki, the Ambassador of Japan to Sweden, to conclude this afternoon event. The floor is yours. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for allowing me to uh, be with you tonight. Um, solar cells and storage are exciting themes. Um, also for a diplomat usually dealing with the more uh, geopolitical affairs. Um, before coming to Sweden, I used to work a lot in the Middle East, and uh, I was very much impressed to see the very severe uh, futile deserts uh, turning into a solar park and combined with uh, a desalination plant and uh, the area uh, being uh, transformed. Last year, uh, during our G7 presidency, one of the theme, uh, important themes were um, economic security. And uh, critical technology, uh, critical materials were a real uh, matter of concern and we need more and more uh, serious cooperation between uh, like-minded countries uh, like Japan and Sweden. And uh, in that context, um, scientific research and uh, uh, development is not, um, the, 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 the outcome is not politically neutral. And uh, uh, we, uh, uh, the uh, public sector, and the uh, academic sector uh, would need uh, even further, deeper uh, uh, mutual understanding and uh, dialogue. And I think uh, Japan and Sweden are very well uh, situated to uh, work even more seriously. Um, as ambassador of Japan, I'm very much impressed by the fact that uh, in the bilateral relations, but a part occupied by 
science, technology, and academia is very important. Um, since uh, 1999, we have a bilateral agreement on science and technology. We have now uh, a great uh, university platform of Mirai uh, with 20 Swedish and Japanese universities. And uh, I was uh, really very much impressed by the fact that uh, 100 Japanese attended the annual uh, Mirai seminar organized in Umeo. Um, and in December last year, Japanese funding, um, funding organizations adopted four large-scale uh, joint Japan-Sweden projects on science and technology. So there are uh, good tendencies uh, we are uh, witnessing. And uh, as much as uh, I can and we can, we would like to uh, encourage these kind of uh, exchanges. And studying about the, uh, uh, the new trends uh, in the efforts for uh, development of renewable energy in Sweden is one of the very interesting themes. And I have visited many plants and uh, also local communities working seriously on these matters. But uh, coming to uh, renewable energy and uh, uh, when I see the electricity uh, generation mix, uh, although uh, Swedish electricity is more than 98, 99% um, coming from um, non-fossil uh, energy sources, but the solar uh, is still uh, occupying 1, 2% of the Swedish electricity. And uh, with the development of uh, uh, perovskite solar cell and uh, storage battery systems, I would imagine that the contribution of, of solar would be also even more important uh, in Sweden. So um, I would like to uh, continue to be interested in this area. And I would like to thank everybody working uh, in this area. Uh, and uh, let me uh, pay a highest uh, uh, homage to uh, the uh, moderators and the lecturers today, Professor Thomas Koberga, Professor Anders Hagefeld, Professor Christina Edstrom, Professor Tsutomu Miyasaka, and the biggest thanks to um, Professor Tula Terry of uh, EVA, uh, and Eva, uh, who uh, provided this wonderful venue. And also, uh, big thanks to Professor Kuroda of uh, JSPS Stockholm uh, Center, uh, who has always been uh, um, uh, contributing to the better exchange between uh, Japan and Sweden. Thank you very much, and congratulations. <laughs> You are all invited to a little mingle party upstairs, so don't run away, enjoy it.